These are the men you love to hate. Box office stars who won't be seen with the beautiful people. They are the movie monsters. And the man responsible for giving you these nightmares is Rick Baker, one of Hollywood's premier makeup artists. He has created wonderful horror effects for movies like Star Wars, The Fury, and American Werewolf in London. And Rick not only made this King Kong costume, he was King Kong in every scene of the movie, except for the two in which the mechanical one was used, right? Tell me, Rick, what was it like to be King Kong? It was hot. This suit weighs 50 pounds. I'd lose five pounds a day. It's like a sauna. Gorillas have longer arms than people do, so the arms in a gorilla costume are extended. When the actor wearing the costume moves a finger, the gorilla's finger moves the same way, mechanically. All of his characters are designed with one thing in mind, to scare the pants off you. And we're here to see how he does it. This pressure syringe is used to allow fake blood to ooze through the cuticles of these baker-made fingers. This trick takes three skilled operators, all working together, to run long wire controls just to make a decaying old skeleton wink and smile at you. Materials most often used are fiberglass, polyurethane foam, or foam latex. Combine those elements with Rick's imagination, his talent as a painter, a sculptor, and a mechanic, and you've got a fully animated creation. For us to better understand the technique, he thought it would be best to see it from start to finish. The whole process takes about three hours and is a lot more work than I thought. Rick is about to make me into a monster. But before it begins my transformation, let's go back a few steps. To create my new image, Rick started with a drawing of his ideas and a basic design. Then a life cast was taken of my face using alginate, a dental material. On this cast, he molded a clay mask and added the new horror features to duplicate his drawing. This mold is then cast in foam latex, which makes the mask that he's about to apply on my face. Using theatrical adhesive, he carefully glues all the edges of the mask to blend perfectly onto the face. The next step is applying a base makeup color. In the eye area, Rick carefully blends the base coat to look completely natural. He then paints highlights and shadows by using many color variations to create a lifelike impression. You see, open your eyes again. Kind of smile. Glorious smile. And like all good makeup sessions, it ends with a little powder and a little shine. And here's the new me. <laughs> hey, that's not too bad. Maybe I'll start my own cosmetic line. What do you say? I'm in the cemetery of St. Michael's Church in Dublin, Ireland. Now, I know from here it looks just like any ordinary church cemetery, but underneath the church itself is a crypt that's anything but ordinary. Now, if you're feeling up to it, follow me. This huge iron trap door leads down to the crypt and 43 separate underground passages. Let's hope I get the right one. St. Michael's Church was originally built in the year 1086, but the present church and these vaults are believed to date back to the 17th century. They say they put these coffins behind bars to keep away the body snatchers. Ugh. Well, this looks like the place. And these are the mummies of St. Mikan's. No one is exactly sure why the mummies are so well preserved, but one theory is that the church was originally surrounded by an oak forest, and the tannic acid in the tree roots soaked down into the vault. 
Now, tannic acid is the same stuff used to cure cow skins, but judging from the results, it seems to have worked just as well on human skin. Among these four bodies is a nun and a crusader who was so tall that they had to cut off his feet to fit him into the coffin. And according to an old Dublin tradition, anyone with enough courage to touch his hand will be rewarded with a year's good luck. Well, I, I guess it's worth a try. You know, I, I think I'd rather just go look for a four-leaf clover. <laughs> this is Desiree Goyette with the mummies of St. Mikan's. Because Paul Rathjam of Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, you asked for it. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, my friends, to the house of a thousand faces. kind of clowning around here in order to answer this request from uh, Mrs. Hoyle Davis, KBC TV in Los Angeles. She wrote, uh, people that are two-faced are just hikers to Don Post. He operates the most unusual business in Hollywood that's been nicknamed the House of a Thousand Faces. How about a visit to his unique studios? Thank you. Well, here's the place, Mrs. Davis, truly a house of a thousand faces. And this is Don Post, their creator. Hi, Don. Hi, Art. Thank you, Mrs. Davis, for asking for it. Now, I want to tell you, these masks here would really are real enough to fool anybody. We're pretty proud of them, taking a good many years of research to develop the right formula. Mm -hmm. Want to try a few on? Yeah, I'd kind of like to. Let's see. Uh, oh, gay nighty. Hmm? <laughs> uh, this is it. Janitor, I guess, huh? All you need is a broom. A uh, lavender and old lace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, they got real character there, believe me. Now, the character, do you uh, kind of dream it up, or do you use sketches or photos, Don? Some are dreams, believe me. Others are pretty cut and dry. Take the monsters. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew what we wanted there. But others are a little tougher. Recognize this fellow? Oh, uh, Fagin, yeah. Oliver Twist. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, uh, in making Fagin, we didn't want to copy him line for line. Instead, we made a change here and there. Yeah, this is Go clay, huh? That's, right. That's your first job, a real That's modeling right. in clay. Then what? Then we make a mold. We pour plaster over the completed clay model, and... This fill is it. kind of a negative in there now, huh? That's Opposite. right. Mm -hmm. Fill it with liquid rubber. Ah. Actually, it's latex. Right to the top, like this. Oh, old face, huh? We wait a couple of hours, and after we pour out the excess rubber, we simply peel out the new mask like this. Ah. Then it's ready for the finishing touches. That's right. It has to be painted. Now all we have to do is use our airbrush. Mm. Now we put on a little hair like this. Turn it up a bit. And we have a completed mask that would look like this. Hmm. Oops. That's your interpretation of Fagin, huh? That's right. See, Fagin Baker. That's me. <laughs> yeah. I didn't like that admiration in your face there. I tell you, this is really a wonderful lesson you've given us in wonderful character masks, believe me. 
Art, come over sometime. We'll make an Art Baker face. No, you won't. One mug like this is enough. But thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Art. And to you, Mrs. Va Mrs. Davis, through you we got to see the house of a thousand faces because you asked for it. <laughs> From the deepest reaches of outer space, from the bowels of the earth, from the castles of Transylvania, the strange, the misbegotten, the unspeakable have all converged here, in a quiet house in Los Angeles, wherein resides the master of them all, the evil intelligence that broods over their activities, Dr. Acula. I lose more cleaning ladies this way. For 55 years, Forrest Ackerman, known as Forey to friends and monsters alike, has been into horror, science fiction, and fantasy. I was riding around in the car in 1954, had the radio on, something was uh, mentioned about hi-fi, and since science fiction is always on the top of my tongue, the notion of sci-fi rolled right off it. Oh, Forey, I didn't recognize you without that mask on. Oh, well, I, I just use that for a disguise when I go out shopping so I won't be recognized by all my fans and get mobbed. Well, it did look pretty inconspicuous, I guess. What was that, anyway? Oh, I uh, was an alien astronaut when I wore that in a pilot for TV called Starstruck. Science fiction, in this case, means a collection reported to be worth over $10 million. This figure translates into over 300,000 items of every imaginable description. There's this uh, latest acquisition for my museum. It's the uh, Dr. Cyclops helmet. And also from uh, 1919 animated film, a forerunner of the Lost World and King Kong, and it's called The Ghost of Slumber Mountain. This is the arm that was detached from the body of the bloodthirsty carrot that menaced an intrepid band of earthlings in The Thing. And this, Desiree, is a Boris Karloff poster for The Devil Commands. You might say it was a seance fiction film because it was about ghosts. Here we have all that's left of that naughty bloodsucker Nosferatu after the vampire hunters had dispatched him to his just reward. Bela Lugosi was the original Dracula in the American version, although the German Nosferatu preceded it by several years. From Lugosi's own collection, the black cloak that was worn in the movie, the script from the play, and the original Dracula ring that Lugosi wore on the set. You are a wise man, Van Helsink, for one who has lived but a single lifetime. You know, the only thing about a collection like this is, um, what do you do when the lights go out? There are only capes and masks and things. This is Desiree Goyette at the Acker Mansion, because Jim Healy, you asked for it. Yeah, hurry over, hurry and gather round quickly, my friend. This is something you have to see in order to believe. Step up and thank you for stepping up closer, my friend. I want you to see one of the strangest phenomena of all time. As I said, you've got to see it. And we have tickets for free for all of you to enter because well, uh, because a Mr. Harold White of New York City, New York, asked for it, that's why. He said, dear Art Baker, I've heard of a headless woman who tours the country as a sideshow attraction, and I don't think it's possible for a human body without a head to be kept alive. So I'm asking to see this woman on your show to find out if she is really genuine. Signed, Harold White. Mr. White, that headless woman that you asked for is right inside here. Her name is Olga Hessler. As to whether it's genuine, I am not in a position to say. I will leave that to you. Tell you what, let's all go in and find out and straighten this thing out once and for all, because uh, you asked for it. Here are the highlights for this phenomenal attraction. Her name is Olga Hessler, who was injured in a train wreck going from Paris to Berlin. Her brain was pierced and her head was crushed. Aboard that same train, a famous medical doctor scientist gave her the medical attention that she needed. He asked permission of the government if he could keep the girl alive. And now, with the aid of medical science, we're going to show you that she's alive, living and breathing in front of your eyes. Here 
is the oxygen tank that we use to keep the girl breathing. This is the meter that we register the amount of air that goes into the girl's body. And as we increase the oxygen, we want you to notice the heavy breathing of the body. This girl is fed seven times a day using a liquid diet. The vitamins, the minerals, passing into this glass tube of liquid, and then on through this rubber tube you see here, which is connected with the girl and into her body. She's fed practically once every three hours, receiving seven meals a day, and that's the way we feed this girl. The important question that people ask, is she really alive? Is it a real person? Well, the only way that we could prove that to you is by shocking the nerve system. Look, this is the generator that produces the electricity that shocks the nervous system, causing the body to move. Watch this. And that, folks, concludes my part of the performance. We do want to thank you very much for your kind attention. And now right back over to Art Baker. And you sure had my attention, believe me, riveted on that amazing demonstration. But I have an obligation here to answer a question very definitely. Said, uh, is this real or is this a trick? Well, Art, it really is a trick mm -hmm. and a darn good one, too. I'll have to have it explained. Well, I'll explain that to you. Where the girl's head would be, we have this apparatus. Now there's a mirror right in this position, right here. And another mirror on this side. It's reflecting the walls, which gives the illusion of looking right straight through, making it appear headless. We'll turn the girl around so you could understand what I mean. And there you see, uh -huh. a normal person. There's her head, of course. Here's the back of the mirror that I pointed to, and there's one more on the other side. And as I bring her back to her original position, you can see how Olga, the headless woman, is shown all over the country. And baffled thousands and thousands of people. I'm glad to know that she's well and normal, <laughs> believe me. That is the most baffling of all. That came from overseas, didn't it? Germany, you? yes. Mm -hmm. That was imported. We want to thank you and uh, say, Olga, yeah, thank you for being alive, honey, and well up there. And we thank you very much for once more uh, showing and explaining how this illusion is done. Thank you. And to you, Mr. Harold White out there in New York City, New York, believe me, we're all a good deal smarter right now because, once again, it was explained because you asked for it. <laughs> to the faint-hearted and the children, one of the screen's most grotesque monsters of all time returns. Remember, Mr. Ben Papa Pietro of San Francisco, you asked for it. You wrote this. When I was a youngster, I remember seeing the Phantom of the Opera with Lon Chaney Sr. The scene that scared me stiff was where the Phantom's mask was ripped off while he played the organ underneath the Paris Opera House. That hideous face haunted me for years but I'd still like to see that scene again with all of its original horror. I know, I'm asking for it. Ben Papa Pietro. Well, Mr. Papa Pietro, you are a brave man indeed. You know, they say that somewhere beneath these subterranean cellars, the spirit of the phantom still lurks. Perhaps your request may bring him back from the past. Shh. I hear footsteps. <laughs>
that haunted you for years. That picture was made 25 in 1925 by Universal. I tell you, you'd have to go some to top that for thrills and chills. However, I saw a pre-screening of Universal International's newest third dimensional picture. It came from outer space, deals with weird characters from another planet. And I'll guarantee that this will be remembered many, many years, as was The Phantom. Incidentally, it's having its uh, premiere, world premiere, here tomorrow in Hollywood, uh, uh, tomorrow night. They're using the large screen, third dimension, and uh, this famous uh, marvelous stereophonic sound. And I tell you, if you want your chills and thrills in third dimension, don't miss it came from outer space. And now, Mr. Papa Pietro, you can stop your shutters now. The Phantom has come and gone. You asked for it. 